Uh, thank you for joining me again, and uh, let's uh, start uh, the uh, principles of the transform approach at the two. Now, in, in this uh, speech, I will focus on the L5 as a formula stenosis. Due to the specific configuration of the L5 S1, TP configuration is a little bit different from the other level, and because of the ALA, we should focus on uh, the L5 S1. Uh, including me, many surgeons perform the transformal approach L5 S1, but uh, roughly 50% is good and 50% is not good. We should focus on why these things happen to the L5 S1 transformal approach. Uh, one of the reason is uh, subtle kinking. It is a hidden in the paper. Uh, it is a hidden pathology. It's a, SAP is a dynamic, uh, one of the dynamic uh, pathology. Sometimes it make a symptom, or sometimes it does not, uh, depending on the patient's posture. Uh, the subtle kinking also is a dynamic factor. Sometimes it make a pain, and sometimes it looks good. It, it, it does not make a pain. So uh, anyway, everybody knows that there is a subpedicular kinking. But what is the pedicular kinking? What is a radiology clue for suspecting the pedicular kinking? There's no document. So just in my experience, I just uh, ex uh, explained something. But it, it, it could be true some in some aspect, but it could not. Anyway, anyway until now, even the disc height collapse, that the, if the superior part, proximal part of the nerve root, there is a free space, that means the free space. Then there is no contacting sp surface, subpedicular area, and the root. It must be okay. But in some cases, it's not, it does not look so severe. The above, the nerve root, there is no free space. And CT coronal view, because of the stress, TP isthmus junction on the surface of the isthmus and the SAP, the cortical bone is uh, hypertrophied. Then the nerve root should run under the pedicle, but there is very little space. And the one of the reason is uh, endoplate spur, and one of the reason is uh, uh, pe so pedicular cortical thickening. That the nerve root can be impinged under the subpedicular area. So uh, we're checking the CT and MRI, and I, saw, and I tried to uh, check in this point, and there is a, I think that, oh, it uh, looks a little narrow, then I performed the subpedicular decompression uh, using a, a pedicle chisel, anteriorly 45 degree bending chisel, just to try to resect the subpedicular area. Cortica thickening can be excised only then I, uh, anyway, I can make uh, more space, one or two millimeters more for the nerve root. And the plate disper is uh, also notorious for, and everybody knows that uh, it could be a pathology. But which spur is a pathology, painful? Which path, which spur is, okay, there's no exact document on the paper, not yet. And the plate disper is a little bit different from the disc uh, rupture. And the the nerve root can be impinged, the pedicle, so pedicle area, and uh, and plate spur. And this session view, the transversely growing, the end plate spur transverse growing, and the coronal view also the subple area is narrow, and the axial view, the smooth round contour is gone, and the uh, end plate, uh, uh, the spur is growing, and very it looks very rough and uh, irregular space. Then we should think, uh, suspect that. So the Sungshu Park, the Korean uh, spine surgeon, uh, categorized on the CT base, categorized the end plate spur, morphological categorize. Normally, there is a little protrusion, is normal, and a little short oblique, short transverse, short transverse protrusion is grade two, and the uh, foramen is uh, very wide, so it is uh, non symptomatic. But transverse long, transverse long, and the foramen height more than 77 millimeters and less than seven meters. 
The firm height is at least 20 and uh, L5 exceeding root occupancy is uh, maximally 30%. So 20 multiplied 30% means uh, 6 millimeters. So at least the 6 millimeters should be preserved from less than 7 millimeters. 6 or 5, then you make uh, nerve root compression. So the transverse, transverse law with the firm height less than the 7 millimeters and hooked up, hooked up spur-like up green upward growing spur can irritate the nerve root, squeeze the nerve root, so it is a, a, a pathologic end plate spur. Oh, when we perform the transforaminal approach, we can see, inspect, and in the decompressed nerve root, those are half, but the nerve root is, is ventral half is still squeezed, so easily neglected even during the surgery. So when you check the CT and the uh, session view and the the CT shows a great the long transfers from the height to less than seven or a hooked up portion. Definitely, we should uh, decompress the ventral half of the nerve root. That is a uh, end plate spur. But the ipsilateral side axis in the lateral recess and foramenal area can be decompressed, and the surface of the nerve root can be excised, decompressed like a disectomy, but the extra foramenal area, we cannot reach there because of the lamina. But the transforaminal approach or the contralateral approach, we can decompress the axillary portion, lateral recess, and the foramenal portion underneath the nerve root and the extra foramenal area fully. So when the nerve, in the actual view CD, the end plate spur is long and wide, so the, at least the lateral is from to external foramen area 15, then we choose the contralateral approach or the transforming approach. If the lateral accessing just uh, stopped, just ex in, uh, the, in the middle side of the external foramen area, then the external foramen area and the plate spur is still left. It can make a pain, it could make a pain, or sometimes uh, if lucky, there is no pain. Anyway, it's limited. Eh? So the, for the accessing, for the decompression and the end plate spur, we have to choose the approach. Frau syndrome is also hidden. We have a concept and we have eyes to read the CT on MRI, then we can expect, we can suspect the uh, Farrow syndrome, but it's just the uh, normal eyes. We have no idea of what happened to the L5 as an extra foramen area. Normally, conventionally, the Farrow syndrome means a syndrome is syndrome, not a, there must be a pain. Something happened, but we're not catches what happened to that on the radiologic clues. That is a syndrome. So the foramen outside, there is something happened, then we uh, call it the Farrow syndrome, conventionally. But uh, as an endoscopic view, actually the foramen is SAP and uh, disc is a problem. Extra foramenal area is a foramen is a wide and open. So the extra foramenal area pathology is the extra foramenal disc mostly only. And the Frau syndrome L5 has happened, the TP is most junction, TP a la junction. So we should differentiate the, the pathologies because it's a foramen area, there's only disc problem, and the frowd area L5S1 is a, a distal TP and a la junctional problem. It's a bony pathology. Why these things happen? Because the lumbosacral angle, TP is angled ventral portion, distal portion is angulated ventrally, so the this uh, distal TP ventral portion uh, it can touch, uh, the can squeeze the nerve root at the TP outlet junction when the disc height collapse and disc extrusion and the ventral slip in listesis. Then the nerve root can be impinged uh, this area. Why these are, we call it this are TP? Because of the angulation, the whole area is not a pathology. Whole TP is not a pathology. Only distal or ventral area. This the ventral area can compress the nerve root. It's just like, like a book etch. The book cover etch can comp just uh, compress in the nerve root. The dozer surface it never touches the, the this root. So we call it the L5 transverse process, L5 TP distal ventra, DV spur, L5 TP DV spur, surely we call it like that. So this is a distal surface, it's a ventral uh, protrusion, uh, protrusion spur, so we have to resecting this area and the nerve root is coming out. On the CT coronal view, 
the mostly it, the Farrar syndrome happened in the coronal tilting uh, area. So the right side, okay, always the left side of symptomatic area and the two to the ventral slip TP is also prolapsed ventrally in, uh, along the, uh, the ala, uh, the axis. So we can uh, classify the we can staging uh, the Farrow syndrome. When the disc is good, the, the TP is should be located neutrally on the line of the ala is a stage one is normal and the disc height is collapsed and no ventral slip is stage two, only uh, the foramen height is narrow and the Farrow syndrome could be okay. But uh, there is a ventral slip then the extra foramenal area definitely must be narrowed and the nerve root can be impinged between the TP ala junction. So when the CT shows such kind of ventral sleep and the spur long times, and then we should check the transferminal area under the TP distal of ventral. Ventral area spur should be excised. So in the, in the, in the microscopic approach to solve the Farrow syndrome, they, they said that unroofing the nerve, unroofing this phrase is transformal area, so distal TP, so pedicular area, and SAP tip fully, and even along the ala portion. On a roofy hole, the bony structures can be decompressed to solve this problem. But I totally agree with that, but the SAP, the lateral plan, should be preserved. So when you sacrifice to solve this problem, when you access into the transformal approach and excise the superior optical process fully, then the disc height is collapsing down and, uh, and the coronal tilting, the frow symptom uh, becomes aggravated and the disc height collapse and the LS1 root can be impinged on the lateral recess if there is a, a lateral recess spur. So when you sacrifice the SAP lateral flannel, SAP fully, is uh, such case of uh, Samson and Delilah. So when you, the, when you excess, excise the lateral plan, when you trans hold any kind of transformal approach, then you collapse the whole nation and you will also be dead. And the final one. So all day long, all day long I, I, I focused on the formal decompression. Then always is happy and always successful? No. Uh, in my case, I only counted on L5 as only 60% is happy and 40% is not good, and then the more than 14% more than need early revision cases. So sometimes good, sometimes bad. Why these things happen? We learned that the, if the disc height collapsed more than 50%, 80%, and no more collapse and no more progression, and it stabilized because of Kirkwood Willis theory, the fuzz is hypertrophied and disc is stabilized and calcified, and no more progression anymore, only stenosis is left. No. Is there any m m m motion? Is a re we call it radiographic observation and instability, four millimeter century sleep and then 10 uh, degree hypermotion. No, it's stabilized, fully decompressed, fully collapsed. Even the end plate is uh, fractured because there is no disc and the foraminal stenosis. So I decompressed the foramen. But if you need, if you need after though a few, week, a few months later, the, the end plate the fractured, stress fracture is uh, progress and the foramen now the, and the endoplates collapse and the foramenal standards happen again. Why these things happen? Because I sacrificed the SAP fully. Even without that, it is still progressed because the before, even before the surgery, foramenal compression, and the plate, there is a stress fracture, fatigue fracture, and the, 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 the signal of the endoplates already changed. That means it still progressed the motion and instability. We call it symptomatic, clinically symptomatic instability. So it's never, never stabilized. So the buttock pain, radicular pain can be solved, but the buttock, due to the buttock pain, the grandma cannot walk a longer distance, only five minutes walking and standing five minutes, then they have to uh, stop walking and have to sit down because of the buttock pain, referred pain. So actually, we just normally said that the other release said that talking about the instability. That is a observational radiography instability, hypermotion, but the hypermotion happened in the very early stage of degeneration in the listesis. 
So every review paper said that uh, it is it happened in the very early stages. So when the per and the degeneration is pressed down and the uh, uh, facet is stabilized and the motion is decreased and there's the, no need of the fusion, only the compression needed. Every review uh, review paper said uh, like that. But uh, in clinical symptomatic instability, it happened in the last stage of degeneration. Such kind of degeneration never stopped the pain, never stopped the degeneration. The end plate is maceration and collapsed. Both sides of the uh, facet is prolapsed, then the kyphosis, the second kyphosis happened, and then the plate is maceration happened. It is clinically symptomatic instability. And the canal is narrowed, central canal is very narrowed. But mostly in the list, this is a grade one, one side coronal segmental. Uh, scoliosis and segment collapsing and discus collapse and the plate is color and there was a signal has changed there still pain then we need a fusion so is my clinical very private excuse me but the very private indication of the fusion surgery so the end plate color this kind of collapse mode a 50 and 50 AD and the end plate and the bony signals that changed totally and the foramenal signals happened and I recommended the fusion so to restore the bony uh, the, this, this kind and the screw fixation it's okay we can solve one problem but the problem is if you perform the fusion surgery in MIS technique it's okay but when you try the endoscope surgery the learning curve is very long, and there are still hidden, huh? hidden potential complications. And the TLV is also, when you put the cage on one side, you just open both sides of the fasten and release the fasten, and the cage is interested safely, it's okay. But in these days, everybody performed a minimal, minimal massive MIS the TLF. One side of fasten, one side of foramen is open, just to try to put it in the bigger one bigger cage. Then the other side is, is uh, the end place is broken. So if the cage is not posted yet properly, then the cage early prolapsed and the cage is inserted forcefully. The end plate is fractured and is still left in the male union and it compresses and irritates the nerve root. And uh, in these days, the segmental loaders is one level. Segmental loaders is also very important to prevent the ASD. But we, after collapsing of two or three millimeters of the end plate, uh, the segmental loaders has gone away. And uh, lately, lately, if there is non union, the, the end plate collapsed more and more and more, and the posteriorly end plate fractured fragment irritated nerve root and, uh, pro and the slip away, and the metal loosening and non union, big disaster. But the big surgery is needed. So, the most common etiology of cage related T leaf is cage itself. So, how about the endoscopy leaf? Fusion rate is very nice. Everybody said that and the plate preparation and bone graft and the everything, everything is okay, everything. But the problem is the technique is difficult. Only the compression need uh, more than 100 cases and the filter for the fusion, the more than 30 or 40 cases and 70 cases of the fusion, then one or two or three years is needed. Then the every patient visited you, you are just starting endoscopy surgery, then all the patients are uh, in, in, in the danger of the rolling curve your, of yours. And the operating time is much longer than the open to leave. And uh, still, in a very narrow space, we handle the big uh, device and the big cage, so there is a high risk of direct tear and root injury. So we should learn the portals, the water control, and triangulation, and the sublaminar decompression, and chisel ball technique, and bleeding control, and we should understand regional anatomy, and we choose the approaches, and do, if there is dura here, we, do, we, we should control the dura management. So many things we should learn there before starting the TLF, endoscopy TLF. If there is one miss, then all the fusion, the result of the clinical result of the fusion is, uh, not good. So we have a negotiation. We have a negotiation tricks. Before you are being very excellent to endoscopic fusion surgeon. So I choose, uh, I performed uh, a little cases. It's, uh, it's, it's my personal experience. Uh, there is a facet fusion 
the PLF, you know, the post-lateral fusion. We just believe the PLF um, is not that bad. It's not bad. It's not a cage, but it's not bad. But the what the the fast fusion rate is much higher than the post-lateral fusion, and we don't need to muscle wider muscle dilation, muscle injury, rather than the post-lateral fusion. And uh, there are several reports of the fast fusion, and the uh, fusion rate is very high because we just uh, fuse only small bone with the little gap. So only one side, even one side, one or two side of the fast fusion is uh, concluded, is decided as a fusion. So using a uh, scope, we can see the facet and uh, eliminate the, the decortication and denudation of the facet and uh, put it the bone graft. And uh, with the small bone graft, we can fuse the facet. The uh, base of the fusion is uh, the 50 millimeters long and uh, 10 millimeters wide. It's 18 percent of uh, the, f uh, the uh, in contrary to the uh, disc space vertebral body. The 18 percent is the same same surface of the 80 percent of the vertebral body. So uh, uh, using a bar in transforminal approach. In transforminal approach, this angle, this angle is a similar, very exactly same parallel to the facet uh, joint, and so we can easily access uh, to the facet very vertically. And uh, using a two or three beliefs burr, we can uh, decompress uh, denudation and decortication of the facet. And uh, I need a very early fusion, so I tried uh, the, the BMP with the TCP and the base. And then the wheezing uh, on the bone, autobone is harvested from the spinous process. Always we have to resect this area and put it very small bone chip after that. So in digital uh, scoliolist, this is uh, two, three, and just the, the left side is a problem. So I just put it one side of the pedicle screw. Facet is both sides is alive, so the unilateral fixation is okay. And uh, in unilateral pedicle fixation is uh, shows the long-term result of the lower ASD than the bilateral uh, pedicle screw fixation. And uh, level five, the central and the foraminal stenosis, the compression both sides and uh, uh, facet fusion and unilateral screw fixation. It's ASD 2-3, uh, scolial, uh, is, uh, is a kyphalist, this is of end place, the fractured maceration, and this state is not a good foramen stenosis. So, so I uh, released the, the, the rod in this point and the screwing the one side, the moving the upper and bone graft, uh, the facet joint. So, preoperatively, postoperatively CT, and the following three months after that, I found some change on the facet. It is not a, not too strong. It's only three months, but the facet spiny surface has changed. It looks like uh, some kind of fusion. So anyway, the clinical symptom is okay. But the clinical symptom satisfaction in early stage comes from the result of the decompression, not the fusion. So the full decompression, formal decompression, is more important than the fusion technique. Only the instrument and the fusion is augmentation to prevent further collapsing of the segment. So uh, in endoscopies, the, the fusion indication is uh, uh, clinical symptomatic instability rather than the radiographic observational instability. So now from today, we just try to think as an endoscopist rather than open spine surgeon. Then you can change the word and you can give a big hope to the senile grandma and grandpa. Thank you. Thank you very much.